Matthew chapter number 13. This chapter is a very unique chapter in that it gives us insight into what Jesus did on a regular basis when he went into the synagogue or when a multitude came to him and he taught or he preached to them. We see the method that Jesus taught to them in. Uh, can I say this, that there's all kinds of methods of preaching. Uh, there's expository preaching, which is line upon line, precept upon precept. There's preaching on typology, where you look at the examples or the pictures of what it's talking about and refer them to other scripture. There's preaching on numerology and what numbers mean in the Bible. There's uh, preaching on, that is topical and you take a certain topic and you preach on it. There's all kinds of wonderful preaching. I, I, I laugh when I, I hear men say, well, if you're not preaching expository preaching, you're not preaching the Word of God. I'm thinking, well, you jackpot, what are you talking about? huh?" Uh, but we find that Jesus taught in parables. And again, a parable is a earthly story with a hidden heavenly meaning. And Jesus often spoke in parables, and Matthew chapter 13 is a collection of several of the parables that he taught. We're going to look at one tonight. In Matthew chapter 13, we'll look at verse 33. The Bible says this, And another, another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the two good songs we enjoyed. We thank you for the congregational singing. We thank you for the good testimony. We thank you for being a good God. Lord, we thank you for hearing and answering prayer. We thank you, Father, for being so much better to us than we really deserve. And, Father, we certainly thank you for the precious promises and the Word of God. Lord, we're thankful you're constantly abiding. And Lord, we're thankful for the blessed hope that one day we're going home. But Lord, until then, I pray we'd be busy about your business. And God, we'd be found faithful to the name of our darling Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, Father, I pray for Brother Phil. Lord, I know he'd be here tonight if he wasn't in the hospital. And Lord, I pray for him. I pray you'd touch him. And I pray that, Lord, uh, uh, you'd help him to recover from this pneumonia, and God, you'd raise him up. I not only pray that for him, I pray that for Brother J.D., I pray that for Brother Bobby, I pray you'd touch these men of God. I pray for Brother Stewart and his family, you know what is needed there. God, I pray your grace upon that need. I pray, Lord, for Brother Tony's grandfather, Lord, you'd touch him, you know the need there. And then, Father, we pray for Miss Mary, you'd continue to help her and strengthen her. And God, we pray for her. We pray for others tonight that are sick. Lord, I'm thankful that you've helped some that were sick get back with us. It's good to see Brother Thad tonight. Thank you for helping him and Miss Rhonda as well. Now, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd be with those that are traveling. And God, I certainly pray that you'd be with those that are watching via live stream. But for the next few minutes, I pray you'd help us from the Word of God. Father, without your help, without your touch, Lord, we'll not get any help. We'll not get anything tonight. We'll leave out just as empty as we came in. So we need some help from Thee. God, we know that, Lord, uh, You do all things well, and God, we pray You'd help us tonight from the Scriptures. Bless now. Lord, we certainly pray if there be anybody unsaved, tonight be the night of their salvation. We pray for the saints of God, that, Lord, tonight You'd stir their hearts, and God, You'd send revival these days. Bless every true church assembled tonight, preaching the word of God. God, give them souls for their labor. Help them, Lord, to be lighthouses to their communities. And Father, we'll thank you for it. Lord, we love you. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple things. I want you to notice, first of all, 
the parable taught. In verse number 33, the Bible says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. That's it. That's the parable. Did you get it? That's it. It's all he spoke on this parable. Uh, now, there's many conjectures as to what the meaning of this parable actually is. Uh, if we had time, we could go look uh, uh, in the book of Galatians. We could go look at 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul, uh, speaking to both of those local churches, uh, 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 where uh, one had sin in the midst, the church at Corinth, uh, and one, the church of Galatians, had embraced some false doctrine. Uh, and Paul said this, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Uh, in both those connotations, he's speaking of leaven very negatively. Uh, if you let sin uh, creep in, it uh, uh, won't be long till sin's going to take over. Uh, you've got to deal with sin uh, uh, or else, friend, you're going to have a problem. Uh, the same thing with false doctrine. Uh, you let false doctrine slip in uh, and it won't be long. You'll believe everything that's, and be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Uh, that's why you've got to keep the, uh, uh, the teaching and the preaching pure. That's why you've got to straighten out things uh, when they come along. Uh, I know sometimes people get uncomfortable when I start naming names about uh, some of the false preachers in our day and some of the false doctrine. Uh, but listen, Paul told that church at Galatians, uh, if uh, anyone else or even if an angel preached any other gospel unto them than that he had preached, uh, he said, let them be accursed. Uh, he said, let them die and go to hell before you believe that terrible doctrine. Uh, it's very, very important to have the right doctrine. That's why we put so much emphasis on it around here. Uh, it's so important because it don't take but a little leaven to lead you astray. You start questioning the Bible, that's what Satan did to Eve in the garden. She started questioning what God had told them, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're all in a mess. Hmm? So we see that leaven used in those connotations is dealing with it in a negative aspect. But look at this parable again, since some of you acted like you didn't get it. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Now this don't sound like a negative connotation. He's talking about this: the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. That when added to these uh, measures of meal, they all... It was totally took over. It said uh, 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 that the uh, um, hole was leavened. So it's talking about something in a positive light. So what's this referring to? It's referring to when you got born again, the Spirit of God moved in you. And as the Spirit of God moved in you, He started working on you. I dare say that nobody was perfect when they got saved. I dare say none of us are perfect since we got saved. Uh, but if you've been saved any length of time, uh, you ought to be a whole lot closer to the things of God than you was when you first got saved. Uh, when you first got saved, the Spirit of God started moving in you, uh, started convicting you about things you might have said or places you used to go uh, or ways you used to conduct yourself. Uh, and He began to work on you. Uh, and He began to grow you and mature you. Uh, when you first got saved, all you understood was the love of God and that's a good thing to uh, uh, embrace. Uh, what a blessing when we got saved. We just uh, uh, experienced a whole new world and all we knew is that we loved everybody because Jesus loved us uh, and we were on the sincere milk of the word uh, and every story was new and every song was new uh, and it was wonderful uh, and the Lord began to grow us uh, and uh, uh, then his life comes, uh, comes along. Uh, you start going through trials and you start going through pressure and you start going through obstacles uh, and that same spirit of God uh, takes the Bible that has been preached to you and helps you through those things uh, and he grows you and matures you until one day uh, 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 we'll be complete. Uh, one day uh, 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 the spirit of God will uh, bring us to the point of maturity to where hey uh, what a blessing when Jesus is ready to take us home we get a body like him and we'll look like him. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, he's still working on us. But the more you let him work, the more you're going to be like the Lord. 
And that's in essence what he's saying in this parable. That's what the kingdom of heaven's like. It's like leaven. It, it, it's introduced to the meal and all of a sudden, before it's all said and done, the whole was leavened. So we see the parable taught. Notice the prophecy brought. Look at verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. Can I say when Jesus came, he not only came to go to the cross and die for our sins, he came to fulfill the word of God. God had made, made many prom promises, and he gave prophecies as to when the Messiah showed up, they should recognize him. And can I say that Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies? Uh, I uh, once read a track, I probably still have it in my office somewhere, said if you took a silver dollar and you put it uh, 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 down uh, uh, for every uh, odd of Jesus fulfilling just seven prophecies. Now, he fulfilled many, now all of them. But just take seven. And the odds of one man fulfilling just seven prophecies in the Word of God, uh, uh, if you took a silver dollar for every one of the odds, uh, it would cover the whole state of Texas knee-high. That's if he just did seven. But he fulfilled them all. And one of the proph uh, prophecies, what? He would speak in parables, which he did. Uh, Isaiah 35 said only God could open blinded eyes and make them see. Uh, uh, it lets everything in the Old Testament uh, was a picture or a promise uh, of what the prophet, uh, the Messiah would be like when he came. And when he came, uh, he fulfilled them. They should have recognized him. Hmm? First prophecy concerning Jesus is in Genesis 3.15. That he would bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. The seed of the woman, right there we knew that the Lord was going to send His Messiah through the birth canal of a woman. We find later that she'll be a virgin. We find that His name be called Wonderful Counselor. And we could go through all the prophecies. Uh, 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 what a blessing to know uh, that Jesus proved who He was. Hmm? The sad thing is they didn't recognize Him when He came. Now, this is where I have a lot of caution in my forefront of my brain right here. The Pharisees had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They called it the Pentateuch. They had that committed to memory. They understood throughout studying the Scriptures all the mountaintops of prophecies. They understood Messiah was coming. They understood when Jesus comes, his literal second coming, how he's going to put an end to all those fighting against Israel and how he's going to rule and reign from the throne of David forever, uh, I mean for a thousand years. They understood all that. They understood that from Isaiah 11. They understood uh, all the things about him being Messiah, but they missed all the prophecies about him being Savior. They did not look in Isaiah 9, although they embraced Isaiah 11. When Jesus showed up, the most religious men of the day didn't recognize him. Now I say that because I hear preachers all the time saying, well, he's going to look like this, he's going to do this, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You better be careful. If they miss some things, I wonder what we're missing. We see... The parable taught, the prophecy brought, but notice the privacy wrought. Look with me again at verse 35. The Bible says this, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. Here's what he goes on to say. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Notice the privacy wrought or brought forward. He said, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. The Apostle Paul in his writings talk about the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Can I say that Jesus revealed some of the things that were secret 
from the foundation of the world. That word secret just simply means that. Things yet to be revealed. He started revealing things that blew their minds. Did it not say in the scriptures that never a man spoke like Jesus spoke? When he would speak, it would dumbfound them. They would uh, be looking to stone him until he spoke, and then they just stood there baffled. Hmm? They thought they had him caught concerning the law until he spoke. And he revealed things they never even considered. But can I say he revealed secrets that had been kept from the foundation of the world. And I was reading this yesterday, and that phrase from the foundation of the world jumped out at me. And with God's help, I want to just preach on that thought. From the foundation of the world. Things may occur to us, but nothing's ever occurred to God. Can I say from the foundation of the world, God had a plan. God has never just been looking around trying to keep up or make up or trying to figure out what to do. God has never been that way. From the foundation of the world, He had a plan. Now, a lot of it He kept secret and He revealed it to in its right and proper time. But from the foundation of the world, uh, he had a plan. Uh, listen to what Acts chapter 2 says in that great message uh, on the day of Pentecost. Peter's uh, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost of preaching. He says this in verse 22 of Acts to chapter 2. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, uh, which God did by him in the midst of you, uh, as ye yourselves also know. Uh, now listen to verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, uh, ye have taken uh, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Uh, 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 Peter revealed unto them uh, that God had a plan, the foreknowledge of God, uh, the determinate counsel of the foreknowledge of God, uh, said before God ever created a world. Uh, he had a plan, uh, and his plan was for Jesus to come uh, and do the signs and the miracles and the wonders uh, and be betrayed into the hands uh, of angry men who would crucify him. Uh, it was God's plan. Uh, Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, God's always had a plan, my dear friends. Uh, listen to me. The Holy Ghost gave me this. Uh, through the ages and seven dispensations of time that we know uh, as outlined in the Scriptures uh, 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 concerning mankind, uh, God has always had a plan to bring man uh, to himself. Uh, though the specifics have differed, uh, the premise has always sought the same thing. Uh, the premise has always sought for God to impute unto man righteousness, uh, for man to have inward repentance, uh, and for man uh, uh, to have inherent reverence towards God uh, uh, through believing and obeying God's commands to the fulfillment uh, of the purpose uh, of God's plan. Uh, Ephesians 1 and 4 says, according as he had chosen us in him uh, before the foundation of the world uh, that we should be holy uh, and without blame before him in love uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ uh, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace uh, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved uh, that's a mouthful but can I say from the foundation of the world, God chose us in Him. Can I say from the foundation of the world, it was predestinated uh, that uh, we would receive the adoption of sonship in Christ Jesus. Uh, 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 that was what was predestinated. Uh, uh, why? According to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Now let me make a few comments here. Do you believe in predestination, Brother Doug? Yes. It's a Bible term. 
I do not believe in predestination as John Calvin taught and as many have embraced since. I do not believe that God predestinated for some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. I do not believe when it talks about the elect that those are the ones that God chose to be saved and those that aren't elect, God chose for them to die and go to hell. If God predestinated some to go to hell, why does the Bible say that Jesus tasted death for every man? Why does the Bible say, whosoever will, let him come? Why does the Bible make provision when God said it's his will that none should perish, uh, but that all should come to repentance? Yes, I believe in predestination. What was predestinated? That everyone who would be saved would be saved through Jesus Christ. That's what was predestinated. Do you know every Old Testament saint got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Do you know in Ephesians chapter number 4 where it says he led captivity captive? Uh, every Old Testament saint went to a place called paradise uh, or in Luke 16 called Abraham's bosom uh, and uh, there they had to stay uh, and they had to wait uh, until the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, uh, shed his blood and resurrected uh, uh, when he went uh, uh, to the lower parts and he preached unto them. What did he preach unto them? The death, burial and resurrection of the Lord. Uh, they had to believe on the Lord like we had to believe on the Lord. Uh, and then uh, when Mary Magdalene appeared unto him there uh, 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 that resurrection morning, he said, touch me not. Uh, why did he say, touch me not? Uh, he had not fully yet ascended to the Father. Uh, he had not taken the blood sacrifice and put it on the mercy seat before the throne of God. Uh, if she'd have touched him, the f uh, sacrifice had been defiled. Uh, there had been no hope for us. Uh, but he took that righteous, royal, redeeming blood that he shed, uh, placed it on the mercy seat uh, before the throne of God, uh, and sinners have uh, a way of uh, acceptance before God. It's by being saved and washed in the blood of Christ. Uh, the foreknowledge of God was uh, that we'd be holy and pure before him, uh, and the only way we'd be holy and pure before God, uh, our sins got to be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, uh, and God made a way uh, uh, through his de determinate counsel and his foreknowledge uh, that everybody would be saved by that same blood. Uh, that's why there is no paradise anymore. That's why it wasn't until the Apostle Paul revealed unto us uh, to be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord. Children of God uh, do not die a sinner's death. The sting of death has been removed for us. Uh, we just go to sleep and wake up in glory. Uh, I bless the Lord. Can I say, we have been put at so much unrest by movements that we're intimidated. We're intimidated to say we believe in predestination. Well, it's a Bible doctrine. But you've got to believe it right. We're scared to death of the Calvinists. We're scared to death about being labeled a Calvinist. So let me help you something. I believe in the foreknowledge of God. I believe in the providence of God. I believe God is sovereign. All of those are terms Calvinists use, and when you say those terms, they label you a Calvinist. Does not the Bible say Jesus was the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the ending? Can I say that God knew the ending from the beginning? That's the foreknowledge of God. God knows it all. Let me help you with something. God knows who will trust Him and who won't, but He still gives everybody the opportunity to trust in Him. Mm. Can I say this? This helped me the first time I ever seen it. Maybe this helps somebody. Not only does God know where I'm going to be in New Jerusalem, John's already saw me in New Jerusalem. Go read Revelation 21. He saw the bride. He's already seen me over there. Huh? What a blessing. Now this will help some of you. Holy Ghost just gave me this. Under the law of witness, you have to have, under the law, there had to be two or three witnesses for something to be established. When you study Bible doctrine, the same law of witness applies. 
You've got to find the same doctrine in the same context written to the same people at least twice or three in order for it to be a doctrine. That's why a lot of charismatics, uh, 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 their doctrine doesn't hold any weight because they take one verse out of context and try to build a doctrine on it. Well, can I say, uh, I've got two witnesses. The Godhead and John has seen me in heaven. I can take refuge in that. Huh? Hmm? That might not help anybody, but it helped me while I was preaching. Uh, we get intimidated by Calvinists. We also get intimidated by the Charismatics. Talking about being full, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a Bible doctrine. Be not drunk with where in his excess, but be rather filled with the Spirit. Hmm? We're to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But can I say there is no second blessing of salvation. When I got saved, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. He saved me and sealed me into the day of promise. But what the charismatics don't understand, they don't understand that the book of Acts is a transitional book. The book of Acts shows uh, how we go from Judaism and living under the law to living under the doctrine of grace and being uh, in the fullness of time of the Gentiles that we have right now. And if you study the book of Acts, you'll find a transition from uh, when folks first believed on the Lord uh, until the four, there's four different transitions. The final one you find in Acts 11, when they heard the word, they believed and they were filled with the Spirit. Up until then, one well, of the apostles had to lay hands on on you to be full, filled with the Spirit. But in Acts chapter 11, they believed, they heard, they were filled. Huh? That's the same way it happens today. Huh? I don't have to go pray somewhere for a second blessing. I got all of God I could handle the first night I got saved. Are you listening? Uh, but can I say we get so scared of charismatic Baptists. Let's don't read James chapter number 5. Let's don't read that. Where do you anoint people with oil? It's a Bible doctrine. Huh? But there's a context. You don't run to the oil. There's no supernatural building in the oil. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And there's an order for it. Uh, they're to call upon the elders to come and pray. There's an order for it, my dear friend. Uh, but anyway, we're scared of charismatics. We're scared to shout. We're scared to wave our hand. Huh? Let me have you something. Baptists were shouting, waving their hands, saying amen long before that charismatic movement came on the scene. You do know the charismatic movement's only 150 years old. You do know the church has been here over 2,000 years. You do know that, don't you? Uh, uh, that's nowhere in my notes. You can come read it. Uh, but you're welcome. I'm just telling you that from the foundation of the world, God's had a plan. And he's given us some insight to what the plan is. We know what's coming in the future. The Lord's coming back for his church. He's going to rapture us out of here. Uh, then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period here on the earth. And after that, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It is described in Daniel chapter number 12. After that, hey, hallelujah, the Lord's coming back in Revelation 19. We're coming back with him on white horses. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14. The mountain's going to split. Uh, uh, he's going to put an end to the battle that's going on in the valley of Megiddo. We call it the battle of Armageddon uh, when all nations have turned and come against Israel. Uh, and he's going to go to slay him with a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth. Uh, uh, the Bible says that the blood will go all the way to bit to the horse's mouth uh, of those that are slain that day uh, and the Lord's going to take up his rule and reign from the throne of David uh, and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years and will rule and reign with him. Uh, during that time Satan will be bound. At the end of that time he'll be loosed and he'll be allowed to tempt all those that will be born during the millennium because those that are on the earth still have their natural bodies. They'll procreate and have children. And they'll have children. There'll be no death for a thousand years. And Satan will try to leave one final revolt against the Lord. He'll destroy him, throw him off into the lake of fire. In Revelation 20, then we get New Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I say all that, say this. God's got a plan. He always has. God's not deterred from the plan. God didn't have to switch things up because mashed potato Biden's in the office. It's all part of God's plan. You realize nobody's put in a position of authority without God putting them there. You say, why did God do that? Maybe it's because people were worshiping Trump. I don't know. Mm -mm. 
Maybe people have had it too good and they need to have a little hard time so they turn to the Lord. All I know is God's got a plan from the foundation of the world. Can I say this? God's always had a promise from the foundation of the world. Huh? We find in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Listen, I'm a King James Bible man because I believe the King James Bible is the Bible for English-speaking people. Listen, the King James Bible is the only English version that came from the Texas Receptus manuscripts. The Texas Receptus was the Southern Greek. It was the everyday man's language. It was the language that the apostles pinned it down in. Can I say every other English, if you want to call it a version, I call it a garbage dump, but every other version, uh, uh, listen, came from the Vaticanus text. The Vaticanus text came out of Rome. Came from the Catholic Church. There are whole verses and even parts of chapters that they omitted because they didn't like. Hmm? Can I say Wilcott and Hort were two wicked men that took the Vaticanus text and brought the first uh, uh, a false English translation into America, introduced to America in 1901, and in that very same year is the first time anyone ever spoke in tongues in America. Falseness brings false doctrine. Uh, I'm a King James Bible man. I believe every word of this Bible is inerrant, infallible. It's God-breathed. It's inspired of God. It is without error. I believe every punctuation mark is without error. I believe everything in this Bible, God penned it down for you and I, and it's forever settled in heaven. They can take every copy they can find and burn it up. Doesn't change the fact it's forever settled in heaven. Uh, hey, uh, I don't have time. I could show you in Acts, uh, uh, Psalms chapter 12 where the Bible come through seven major translations uh, and the last one uh, uh, was English in 1611. Uh, and I bless the Lord. We got a book we can trust in. They did change it about 1762 from the old Elizabethan English to the modern way it's the script that it looks. They didn't change the words. Uh, I've read the Elizabethan. That's what this one is. This is an actual 1611 right here. You read it long enough because the F's look like S's and, you know, the V's are funny. And all, but you start reading it long enough, all of a sudden your eyes adjust to it and you can read it. And you'll find that it says exactly what this one says. Uh, and I bless the Lord we got a Bible we can trust in now can I say there's a there's always been a push to deny God's word anybody that wants to get you away from God's word just mark them uh, they're full of the devil the Bible said try the spirits whether they be of God how do you try somebody's spirit if they're trying to get you away from the Bible they don't have the spirit of God the Holy Ghost of God bears witness with his word because he's the one that pinned it down now, I'm telling you all that because we are now facing a new uh, attack on the Bible from these so-called recovering fundamentalists. People who was raised in churches like ours and they're going around the world apologizing for how they were raised. They don't believe in old-time preaching and old-time singing, old-time shouting, old-time worship. Uh, uh, they'll deny the Bible while they're doing their cracking open a beer and, and uh, 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 telling you it's okay. And they're trying to live wickedly and sinfully uh, and attach religion to it. That's what religion always does, by the way. Uh, they try to justify themselves. Uh, uh, can I say God don't have to justify himself? He pinned down his word and gave us his promises. You know how I know God wrote this book? Because it tells us how bad man is and how great God is. That's how I knew God wrote it. Man wrote it, it tells how wicked God is and how great man is. Hmm? Uh, I got a lot on his promises and that he gave us a promise from the foundation. I've spent too much time. Let me move on. I'll never get done. Can I say from the foundation of the world, God had a person. The Bible says in Revelation 5, verse number 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. 
And he came and took the book out of the right hand and him sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps uh, and golden vials full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book uh, and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed uh, us to God uh, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, uh, and hath made us unto our God kings and priests. Uh, and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne uh, and the beast and the elders uh, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands and thousands uh, saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches uh, and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing uh, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth uh, and such as are in the sea uh, and all that are in them uh, heard I saying blessing and honor and glory glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne uh, and to the Lamb forever and ever. Uh, God's always had a person. Uh, it's his darling son, uh, the Son of God. Uh, hey, it was always meant uh, for him to come and be the Lamb. Uh, it was always meant for him to be slain for our sins. Uh, and one day uh, we'll praise him without uh, any hesitation or any uh, obstacles, uh, uh, any hindrances, uh, and we'll give him the word uh, glory do his name uh, and we'll cry how worthy he is uh, hey he God's always had a person and his name is Jesus Christ uh, and I love him because he first loved me it's easy to love him he's holy it was hard for him to love us because we were filthy but he loved us anyway God's always had a person he's always had a promise he's always had his word uh, forever settled in heaven. I'm talking about from eternity past to eternity future. God's had a promise. He's had a plan. He's had a person. Can I say this? God's always had a place. Mm. He had a place called Mount Calvary. Mm. I believe as Marcy used to sing that song that he grew the tree that he knew would be Calvary. Hmm. When God spoke this world into existence, He knew that little hillside, the place of a skull, is where He would bleed and die for our sins. God's had a place called Calvary. Now, I've never been there physically, but I've been there by faith. If you haven't been to Calvary, you're not going to heaven. God's got a place, place of Calvary. God's got a place, the place of conversion. There is a place you can go back in your mind where you met the Lord. A place under Holy Ghost conviction you might not have known what it was. All you knew is you was miserable and you realized you was lost and you wasn't going to go to heaven that you was an enemy of God, you realize you needed to be saved uh, and you can go back to that place where you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because He changed you. Amen. You pass from death unto life. If you can't go back to the place where you was raised in newness of life, you probably haven't been raised. Mm. Yeah, I'm not saying you have to remember the date. I'm not saying you have to remember the time. I'm not saying you have to remember what the preacher preached on or what somebody told you about the Bible. I'm not saying that you have to remember what you prayed, but you will remember the place where you met the Lord. Mm. Uh, I've told this story. I think I told it not long ago. My grandpa had a had a deacon named Cordell Sherrill. And Brother Cordell Sherrill is the first man I ever heard teach the book of Revelation. Brother Cordell was a good man. He was an iron worker all his life. He's a big, strong man. He was the first man I ever knew that got Alzheimer's. And he was so strong from working on iron all those years you know, he, he kept thinking he was 17 and, and nobody could tell him anything. He didn't recognize his family. They had to put him in a hospital up in Dayton just for Alzheimer's victims. And they had to tie him to the bed at times when he'd have spells because he was so strong. Last time I saw him, we was having homecoming at the church and his boys went and got him, brought him. He was in a wheelchair. He didn't know his wife. Didn't know his boys. Didn't know his daughter-in-laws. Didn't know his grandchildren but he couldn't forget the man who introduced him to Jesus. Never forgot my grandpa. Hmm? 
Huh? I'm telling you, even if you lose your mind, God will still remind you of the place where you met Jesus. There's a place of Calvary. There's a place of conversion. And then he's given us the place of the church. The Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. And I say the church is a special place. It's an oasis in this world. It's a place where we can shut ourselves in and shut out the world. It is a place where we can come and worship Almighty God in spirit and in truth. It's a place where we hear the Word of God expounded upon. It's a place where we are accepted among the beloved. It's a place where we can fellowship uh, and enjoy the goodness of God. Uh, it is a place where we sing songs of praise unto God uh, in hopes that He'll inhabit them and come and sit down amongst us. Uh, it is a place like no other place. Uh, uh, thank the Lord for His church. Uh, now let me qualify this. None of this is my notes, man. I'm never going to get this message done. When I speak of the church, I speak of the local, visible, New Testament body of baptized believers. I'm not talking about some invisible, imaginary whatever. 115 times in the New Testament you'll find the word church. 112 times it's referring to the local, visible, New Testament church like what we have right here. Hmm? Can I say, God does not have a universal church. We live in a day and age where churches are networked together by associations. That's not God's plan. Hmm? By the way, the term Catholic means universal. You're welcome, that didn't cost you anything. Jesus died for local churches. Can I say... There's an independent Baptist church about three and a half, four miles from here. How they worship God, how they serve God, what they do with their money, what they do, I don't really care. Because God put me in this local church. We're independent from one another. If God tells them to uh, uh, quit using song books, that's between them and God, that has no effect on me. Hmm? If they have a different guy preach a revival than we have, who cares? That, that, that has no bearing on us. We're independent churches because that's what he died for. Go and study your Bible. There's the church at Galatia. There's the church at Ephesus. There's the church at Philippi. Go study them. They're, what they're calling them uh, individual local churches. Uh, it didn't say there's all the churches of Galatia. It didn't say that. There's a church at Corinth. And why anybody call themselves Corinthian Baptist Church, I'll never know. But the, it mentions them, the church of Sardis and all the churches. It's talking about those individual local churches. And by the way, the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, those were literal local churches churches. Uh, I know uh, Scofield and I'm a, I got a Scofield Bible, cut my teeth on one. I know a lot of them that were universal churches uh, want to picture that or spiritualize that as seven different ages. Uh, no, those were seven literal churches uh, which picture uh, maybe seven different ages, uh, but they were seven literal local churches. Uh, Jesus loves the church. He gave himself for it. You ought to be a part of the local church. Huh? Uh, I don't apologize to the local church. I'm glad I'm part of it. And by the way, not everything calls itself a church is one of his churches. Uh, and let me just go ahead and say this while I'm on it. On it. There's my darling grandbaby right there. Miss Crystal's got her darling baby somewhere. She's over I see her head. She's about ready to turn one. Isn't that hard to believe? Can I say, Ella Rose did not come into existence without her mama. Elizabeth did not come into existence without her mama. Just like it takes a mama to birth a child, it takes a church to birth a church. Mm. Somebody getting mad and leaving a church and going down the road and starting one, that's not of God. Mm. That's what uh, preacher talks, we call them bastard churches. They weren't started right. Can I say there's a lot of churches that never get off the ground and never do anything because they weren't started right. It takes a church to birth a church. Hmm? And you can find that there in the book of Acts. When they sent Paul and Barnabas out, what they sent them out to do? To start churches. Hmm? Ah. 
Lord have mercy, it was the church at Antioch that started those churches. That's where they were first called Christians. Why? They were doing what God told them to do. Take the gospel to every creature. Establish local churches. Let me help you something. They've not always been called Baptist churches. The early church in the Bible, you find the church was called by its location. What city it was in, what town it was in. By the second century church, they were called by whatever preacher brought the gospel to them. You had Paulicians because they adhered to Paul's gospel, Paul's teachings. You had Waldenses and a bunch of other, Monetists and a bunch of other. They were called by the name of the movement of the preacher. Can I say, yeah, it wasn't until the Catholic Church started slaughtering people for their doctrine because they would not bow before the Catholic Church, uh, we started getting called Anabaptists because we did not believe in infant baptism. About 1530, they just dropped to Anna and started calling us Baptists. But here's what I'm here to say. We haven't always been called local, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists, but we're preaching the same doctrine that Jesus gave the apostles uh, and the apostles preached. Uh, we're still earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, hey, what they stood for, we still stand for. Huh? I bless the Lord. Uh, every time they get a new pope, they change what the Catholics believe. This, one, this new one's embracing the queer movement. Uh, you say, preacher, you shouldn't say queer. At least I didn't say faggot this time. Uh, the Southern Baptists used to stand for what was right. In 1963, they stopped taking their doctrine from the Bible and started taking it from the committee of the Southern Baptists when they go and vote what they believe in. I'm saying recent years, they've filtered and some of their institutions have embraced social drinking. Can I say now, it is before their council, and they've got some wicked, wicked leaders now who are embracing a woman's right to have an abortion, and they too are looking to embrace the, the queer movement. Hmm? They don't want to be tagged as woke. Well, can I help you something? When I got saved, I got woke up. Uh, you call me whatever you want to, but when Jesus calls me, I'm going home. Uh, I'm just saying the church ought to stand for something. And I don't know when the last time you ought to, you've read that church covenant. I preached on it, I don't know, about 10 years ago, but you ought to, you ought to read that church covenant and see what we're really expected with one another. Uh, might help you live a little closer, a little cleaner. Uh, God help us. The Lord's come back for His church. Not come back for a movement. He's come back for His church. And he's come back for a church without spot and without wrinkle. You say, Brother Doug, why are you so hard on some things? Because the Bible is. Uh, God help us. But can I say, from the foundation of the world, God's always had a place where man could meet with Him. Can I say this? From the foundation of the world, God's had a pardon. Isaiah 55, 7, let, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. He will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. We say it this way in the New Testament, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And I got a bunch of other verses I don't have time to get to. From the foundation of the world, God's given us. He's had a pardon. From the foundation of the world, God's had peace. But Clint sang about it. And the peace of God which pass all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. Colossians 3, 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you're called in one body and be you thankful. Huh? When you have the peace of God and the peace of God rules in your heart, you're not easily deterred by what's going on in this world. Hmm? Can I say, from the foundation of the world, God's had a paradise. We call it New Jerusalem. I don't have time. I'd go read Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. John saw new heaven, new earth, and city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. 
That's the city that has the streets of gold, the walls of jasper, the gates of pearl, the 12 foundations. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the city where Jesus himself is the light of the city. That's the place where the church is going to dwell with the Lord forevermore. We sing all them songs about heaven. But long before we ever get to see New Jerusalem, we go to a place called the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in our body. Let me say, first of all, it doesn't matter how you live because you're going to give an account of how you've lived in accordance to that Bible since you've been saved. That's why you need to study the Word of God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. But can I say how you live and how faithful you are to the things of God will determine how you'll reign with Him during the thousand-year millennial reign. We are without excuse. We have the whole counsel of the Word of God. We have a place where we can come and hear it taught and preached. You can carry it with you. You can take it on the job. You can read it all you want to read. We are living in a day where we have not been persecuted for the Bible. And yet, read Hebrews chapter 11 and those others that were sown asunder that long for the promise that we already have. And yet we have the Holy Ghost indwelling us and the Word of God before us and we are the laziest bunch that God's ever had. If we just treat God like we treat our jobs, we'd be better Christians. There are folks that won't miss work. But boy, Sunday morning, I'm getting texts. I got a cough. Well, you can have full-blown COVID and go to work, but you won't come to church if you got a little cough. Can I say, it's not about a cough, it's about what's in your heart. Now, obviously, I don't want you to come to church if you've got full-blown COVID. But there are folks that just look for reasons why not to come. Can I say this? A lot of us won't have very good titles in the, in the millennium. We won't rule over cities and providences. We'll be fortunate if the Lord lets us rule over a garbage dump because we've not been very faithful with what God's blessed us with. But from the foundation of the world, He's had a paradise. And then lastly, I won't read it in Revelation 20, but from the foundation of the world, God's had a place of punishment. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for the soul of man. But men that reject Jesus Christ, that's where they'll go and pay for their own sins. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, Revelation 20, verse 15, and there was found no place for them. Mm. they'll have to die and go to hell because they wouldn't let Jesus pay for their sins and they'll pay for their own sin say so, preacher why the message uh, the whole message really is the fact that God's got everything under control God is still on his throne and God knows how to take care of his children How many would agree with this statement? America's gone soft. Aiden, how old are you? Fifteen. Have I got anybody in here that's eighteen? Bella's about ready to turn eighteen. Anybody else turn eighteen? Any anybody eighteen? I know a bunch of us are older than eighteen. Any young people nineteen? Twenty? I just want you to think of people that are just a little bit older than Aiden, Bella's age. That's who we sent to Normandy Beach in World War II. Amen. Go to the mall and look at the, the young people running around. You think that they would go and do what those men did on Normandy Beach? We've gotten soft. 
I heard stories that when men would go to boot camp up through Vietnam, the first thing the DI, the drill instructor, would ask, who was from Kentucky? And the guys that would raise their hands, they'd make them marksmen because they knew every boy from Kentucky knew how to shoot. Now every boy from Kentucky just knows how to shoot his mouth off or do this. Oh, I'm real good doing this. Huh? America's gone soft. Hmm? Ray, your generation, kids 13, 14 years old going to work every day, laying brick, working hard, those days are gone. Hmm? Uh, I imagine about 15 minutes Colton's looking for a cheeseburger uh, I know you are Fred now some of these boys are good boys they work hard for their dads and their grandparents but as a whole we've gone soft as a nation can I say as a whole we've gone soft as Christians We come to church expecting the preacher to have all the spirituality. But we don't bring God with us. God help us to realize God's got a plan and we need to get with His plan. People are dying and going to hell. What are we doing about it? First thing we need to do is have revival. And second of all, we need to take the fire that God puts in us and take it out there and burn for God. Let them see something different than what they're used to seeing. I get so sick of people tying me in with Joel Olstein. Uh, he ain't even worth slapping. Uh, sissified preacher. You call him that. He don't even call himself a preacher. He calls himself a motivational speaker. He's motivating people to die and go to hell is what he's doing. God help us. From the foundation of the world, God has been orchestrating, and it's all coming down. We need to make up our minds. Are we in or are we out? Are we going to embrace the truth and make a stand? Or are we just going to pine away? I'd like to think we got some folks that will make a stand. I hope so. There's coming a day. We may have our faith put to the test. You won't pass the test that day if you don't build yourself up on your most holy faith today. God help us to just be a part of what God is orchestrating in our midst. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.